Why did you want to be an astronaut? It's, uh, I like to say that it's not me who made the choice. It's not, it's not like I, I chose space, but in a way I was chosen. Um, because I cannot really find a moment in my, in my life where I made a conscious decision, but in a way I always knew that I wanted to travel to space. And it, you know, it goes back to early childhood, so it's maybe just a shortcoming of memory. I don't know, maybe I just don't remember that moment. But, but for me, and also listening to my parents and other adults, I, I just always said, I, I, I want to go to space at some point. And maybe I didn't even know that there was such a thing as an astronaut, but I, I, I knew that I wanted to explore space. I wanted to fly up there. Um, I guess that's probably where it distinguishes a passion from an interest, right? An interest maybe is something you choose, but a passion you're, you're chosen somehow. We'd like to find out a little bit more about the, the background that engendered that passion. Tell me about your hometown and, and your childhood and what it was like, your life was like growing up. I grew up in a, in a, a tiny, small village in the Alps in Italy. Um, it's like a tourist resort, so my, my parents um, had an hotel, which uh, was their job, um, pretty demanding. Um, you know, people came in summer for uh, some relaxing time in the mountains and in winter mainly to ski. Um, and so summers and winters were bustling with life and then the off season like spring and, and autumn were extremely quiet in, in, uh, in this mountain village. Um, and uh, again, my life quite the same, you know, in, in, in summer and winter there were a lot of uh, people coming to the hotel, and uh, which meant also new kids to play with. <laughs> um, so I got used from an early age to meet, meet new kids all the time and to play with them for a while and then they will be gone and then there would be more kids coming and, um, and then off season again it would be more quiet. Uh, very close to nature, um, especially in summer with the good weather. Um, I had, I was very fortunate to enjoy a childhood in which you, you can roam around as a child, you know, unsupervised. You don't have adults with you all the time. You can go and roam around and explore and, and uh, think that just crossing that bridge is really exciting because you're on your own without adults. <laughs> um, or going to explore the river or, you know, maybe I, I even did things that, uh, you know, were dangerous and maybe an adult there would have said, hey, don't do that. But it, it's part of, I think, uh, a valuable, um, childhood experience that you you just experience stuff on your own, um, and maybe that's where I got that taste for adventure that I think is very much part of uh, that desire I always had to to go to space. Uh, the other thing is that when you grow up in a mountain village, there is very little light pollution, so the the night sky is something that is very present. Uh, the, there's a lot of stars that are visible. There, I think in my village around midnight they would turn off anyway with most of the street lighting, uh, which, which wasn't that much anyway. Um, and so the, the night sky and the stars have been a very strong presence in, uh, in my childhood. Um, I always liked to read um, and I was very much encouraged um, also by my, my grandmother taught me to read uh, at a very young age and um, always love to read um, science fiction books, and, and generally speaking, adventure books. Um, so I think that helped too. And, um, and I had really good teachers in elementary school. So elementary school I, I actually attended in this village, and then I, I, I went elsewhere. And um, I, I think I had a very good schooling in my initial years, um, especially like in the last, like fifth grade or so, we, we had, at least at that time in Italy, you started to teach kids about uh, um, astronomy and uh, planets and the moon and th the sun and uh, um, again very good teachers that spark that that interest in me. Did I understand that it, at least for part of your high school you left the country? For part of it yeah um, so uh, when I was in the oh, I guess it would be the 11th grade I decided that it would be cool to spend the 12th grade um, somewhere else that's an option uh, it's like the second last year in the Italian school system um, and so you you have this uh, organizations that offer you that opportunity of uh, becoming an exchange student for a year um, and so I chose to come to the United States uh, mainly I was uh, very interested in uh, uh, in the country itself, again, it was the country that had had the most interesting and excited space program. 
<laughs> and the country of Star Trek. <laughs> um, and of course, I was also very interested in improving my, uh, my knowledge of the English language. Um, and so I spent a year in a high school in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. And then I went back to Italy and I completed high school in, in Italy. And then that, <coughs> excuse me, after that, on to college, um, tell me that story and, and how you got into the Air Force and, and ultimately uh, to the astronaut. Group. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I debated for a while whether I wanted to study physics or engineering. It was like my, my two big interests then growing up were, were science and technology. Um, decided eventually to become an engineer and uh, and I, I decided I, I wanted to go to a different country just to, you know, to master a different language and just to have that cultural experience. I, I, I was always extremely interested in, in both languages and just the fact of experiencing different cultures. Um, not so much traveling. I mean, I, I like traveling too, but I, I, I like to find ways of actually living in a place or somehow sharing the, the experience that the local people live. Um, so I, I ended up not going very far. I went to Germany, um, Munich, the University of Munich, and I studied uh, aerospace engineering there, which was a, a wonderful experience and I think a really good education. And while I was there, I also had a chance of, of uh, participating in other programs. So for a while, I, I studied or I did a research project in uh, in southern France at uh, Subaru in Toulouse, um, and then I. I I was always interested in uh, in Russia and Russian, and uh, of course I knew that that was a very important part of the space program too. Uh, my first attempt at studying Russian was dated back to high school actually, mm -hmm. but that hadn't been very successful. And then uh, it didn't look there was an exchange program between Munich and, and any Russian university, but then for a twist of fate, eventually I found a professor in Italy actually who had a, a, a good uh, uh, connection and a tradition of sending students to uh, this university in Moscow. And, and so I was able to actually do the research for my final thesis at the Mendeleev University in Moscow. Uh, and so I spent about 11 months in, in Moscow between 2000 and 2001. And then throughout all those years, I was actually <coughs> uh, thinking about this other um, passion that had caught my heart, which was um, military flying. Um, now, it, um, strangely enough, the, <laughs> the Italian military had not accepted uh, women um, until the year 2000, I guess. So in the mid-1990s, um, there were, you know, you could hear talking about, you know, we, there will be soon a law that will allow voluntary military service for women. But, you know, this law didn't come and I was getting older and older, of course. And, and normally the, the age limit to join the academy as a pilot is 21. So at some point I turned 21 and then I turned 22 and that law had not come. And then again, for a twist of faith, when the law finally was passed in 99, um, there was a clause that said, for female candidates, we are going to um, extend by three years the age limit. So 21 became 24. That was just for a transition period for the first three years. They wanted to help women out who had waited for so long, and like me. Um, and so I was actually able to finish my engineering studies, and that was the year I spent in Moscow. While I was there, I also applied at the <coughs> at the Air Force Academy. I had to actually come back a couple of times to do part of that selection process. And then basically it was back-to-back uh, -back a big rush. So I finished my engineering studies, I turned in my thesis, and almost the next day I showed up at the, at the Air Force Academy for my studies there. And in a way it was, uh, it wasn't an obvious choice because I was, in a way I was throwing away my engineering studies fully because I had to start again from, from scratch with um, you know, colleagues that basically were out of school and, and so do undergraduate studies again. Um, but, uh, you know, in the end, I think it was worth it. So I spent four years there. Then I went uh, to the United States again for uh, pilot training. Uh, got my wings at uh, Shepard Air Force Base up uh, in northern Texas, which is a NATO school. And then went back to Italy, had to wait a little bit for further training. Um, and then I did my operational conversion of the AMX, which is a, um, a single-seat light attack um, combat aircraft. <coughs> and then for another twist of fate, 
pretty much at the same time as I was doing my operational conversion, which is a very, very demanding and selective training. Um, at this, really at the same time, I was going through the selection process for ESA, um, which in a way was a, was a pity because I was again giving up my operational career that was just starting. But in Europe, uh, we just don't have selections that often or that regularly. So in a way, I really felt it was a once in a lifetime opportunity and I had to grab it. And so um, that process took, um, took a year and then eventually I was lucky enough to be one of the six um, people who um, joined uh, ESA as astronauts in 2009. Was that astronaut selection something that you knew about and, and applied to mm. or had you just put in an application hoping that there would be a selection coming up? Yeah, no, no, there is no um, uh, unsolicited application. <laughs> you, you have to wait for, for, a, for a selection to come up. And again, there had not been one for like 15 years or so. And then, uh, <coughs> I, you know, I, I was not somebody who had a lot of connections in the space business. I mean, not at all. So I didn't have any insight in when was a selection going to come up. You know, I was um, in a very demanding training program in, in the Air Force and you know fully engaged in that and I was very happy in doing what I was doing. But then this news came out, then the selection <laughs> was open. Um, and again it, it you know it could be another fifteen years until the next one comes around. Um, so I, I, I really had to um, to grab that that chance. Now that you are an astronaut uh, do you feel that you're going to be a role model for other European women who have an interest in this field? Um, I hope it's a question I get asked a lot, and uh, in a way, I really hope to be a role model for for anybody who is interested in this field. I don't think the experience is that specific. I mean, there might be some gender connotation, but I don't think the experience is so specific that you know you have to. Comp compartmentalize <laughs> your role modeling um, role. Um, I, I think growing up, you know, I've, 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 I've looked up to, to, to men and women equally and tried to, to learn from, from all the people that I, I, I thought could be role models, something that I could apply in my life. Um, now, of course, what, what can be especially important for women is that it can be encouraging to see that um, you know, you know, women can do that, and in fields where there aren't that many women, can be uh, quite important actually. Um, and, uh, and 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 that's certainly a privileged position to be in. To have this job and to fly in space as you're about to do means that you're accepting some unique risks that most people don't have. Uh, but I assume that you think that's worthwhile since you're doing it. I want to know why. What is it that you think we're learning from flying people in space that makes it worth taking that risk? First of all, I'd like to say, you know, the, you always weigh the risk that you're taking against how much you want something, right? For example, you, you know, there's a risk involved in driving on the highway and to go on holiday, but you, you take that risk because you think it's, it, you, you really want to get to that vacation place, and so you think the, the risk is, uh, is acceptable. So I think for most astronauts, and certainly for me, the desire to be part of this is so strong and it's so ingrained in who I am, it's so part of my identity that I, I would probably just take any risk because it just doesn't compare to that, to that desire that that you have to, to participate in this in this adventure um, overall of course if you if you look at it from from the outside and you want to do a cold, cold cost benefit analysis um, you know I'm one of those people who think that even without going down into details of you know what's the benefit of this what's the benefit of that I think there is a sense of destiny in, in, in this whole idea of space exploration, right? I mean, if, uh, if you ask anybody, you know, imagine humanity in 500 years. Do you imagine humanity being still earthbound, like we still are not able to go anywhere else? I mean, I think we all intuitively, spontaneously imagine humanity as being able to travel 
in, in space, travel to the moon, travel to Mars, travel to asteroids, uh, live there, exploit resources, uh, go on vacation, you know, whatever, do all the, the things that human beings like to do once they have conquered, let's say, a, a, a place. Um, so, you know, it, to me, it's being part of the, you know, the first step towards that future that is so obviously part of, of what's coming for, for humanity. And, and, and really, one, one other thing I like to say is that it, it's, it's very long term and it's difficult as human beings. We have a little lifespan of like 70 years, whatever, 70, 80, 100. <coughs> but, you know, if, 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 if you try and expand to a bigger time scale and think of humanity's uh, presence on Earth, it is dangerous to live only on one planet. So, you know, one day when that big asteroid comes or whatever, you know, we're going to be happy that we have learned starting today how to travel to other places. You and your crewmates are next in line to launch to the International Space Station. Tell me what are the goals of this flight and what your job is going to be on this mission. The International Space Station is this uh, incredible permanent laboratory on low Earth orbit where we can do research in microgravity. So the job of any crew that shows up on station is to uh, continue this uh, scientific research that happens on board. So in part, uh, we will continue experiments that have been running for a while. Uh, sometimes we will wrap up a particular experiment. And uh, in some cases, we will start a new experiment or several new experiments, actually. And that's uh, especially exciting, of course. But then we will also take care of the space station. We will do maintenance work. We will do logistics work. We will take care of cargoes coming and leaving. Some of us might go on spacewalks. We'll do robotics work. And interestingly enough, we will be up there at the beginning of a major reconfiguration work that will take several expeditions and that will set up the space station to be able to run even more robust operations for several years to come. That's reconfiguration internally or externally? Uh, there is uh, some external rec internal reconfiguration going on, but the main goal is really to move around a few modules so that especially the logistics support, so the arrival and departure of cargos is going to be more flexible. We will be able to host multiple um, cargo vehicles at the same time. What are you looking forward to the most to, about seeing once you get there? Um, lots of people would say, you know, you, you, I think I'd run through the cupola and watch the Earth. Um, and yes, I, I am very much looking forward to do that. But to be honest, after so many years of training and the space station being so much part of my daily life, I am just looking forward to seeing the actual space station, you know, to see it, you know, when, when you approach it, to see it coming up as a light dot and then becoming bigger and bigger. And then you start seeing the features. And then, you know, I can see it on the camera or peeking on the periscope of my commander in the Soyuz. I can see the actual image, you know, and it becomes greater and greater and make out the details. And you end up seeing, you know, the solar panels, the stack, your actual docking port, and then actually getting inside. And I just look forward to go ahead and discover all the details of this incredible outpost of humanity in space that, again, has been so much part of my life. I feel that I know so much about it, and I'm really looking forward to actually seeing it with my own eyes. And you're going to be the first female European astronaut to serve as a crew member on board this station. How significant is that for you, for you personally, or for the future of European women in space exploration? I think, as you rightly say, there's two aspects, right? You know, there is your personal point of view and there is the significance that this can have for others. And I, I do think I'm in the position of serving as a role model for young, um, you know, girls and young women in Europe who maybe are thinking of pursuing a career like this or just simply a career in science or technology or, or military flying, which are, are parts of my background. Um, so I, I, I think that's important. I think I'm in a privileged position. Um, on the other hand, from the personal point of view, I think you have to keep your feet very much uh, grounded and realize, you know, you're just a crew member like, like everybody else. There is no special badge of honor uh, associated with uh, being a female. There is nobody out there to try and make your life harder because you're a female. So, you know, you, you, you try to do your job as, as well as you can like everybody else. You're going to arrive at the station just a few weeks after Alexander Gerst comes home. 
there must be some significance to the fact that ESA will have an astronaut on board essentially for one continuous year. Yeah, and that's a first. Uh, and uh, I think uh, everybody in the in the space business in Europe is very excited about it. And uh, I really hope that we get the we are able to get the public excited about this uh, as well. I hope in a way that the public, just Europeans, get used to have fellow Europeans in space, and uh, you know the, they get this feeling that because you know Europe has has been a major player in the space business for for you know for for decades um, in in many aspects. You know not, not only in, in, in human space flight, but uh, also and even more in in other fields. Um, but astronauts attracts attention and curiosity, you know, the, the fact that there's actually human beings going up there, that's just fascinating. Everybody's interested and excited about this. So, um, you know, I, I hope, uh, as I said, that people just get used to this thought that there's, there's fellow Europeans in space and they get a taste for it and maybe want uh, more and more of uh, European space. A space station assembly is essentially complete and the emphasis is really on the science that's being done up there right now. How do you explain to people the significance of, or, or the potential of what we could learn on board this space station? I think what you, um, the, the main point is that it's extremely unique. It's an extremely unique environment. Um, microgravity, which is a fancy word for weightlessness in the end, means that you shut down, you eliminate the effects of gravity. Mind you, there is gravity in low Earth orbit. We're just not that far from Earth. I mean, you know, the gravitational pull of Earth is still about 90% of what it is on the Earth's surface. But the fact that we're on orbit, so we're essentially free falling, shuts down, eliminates the effects of gravity. And that's the only way we have to do that on a long-term permanent basis. I mean, you can, you can do parabolic flights, you know, and for every parabola you will get, you know, maybe 20, 22 seconds of microgravity. Uh, there's drop towers, you know, you, you, you essentially uh, drop something from a, you know, a certain height, and then for a few seconds while it drops, you will have um, some microgravity. There's sounding rockets that will give you a few minutes of microgravity. But to have permanent exposure to this very special, unique environment for research, you have to go to the International Space Station. And so um, in the human physiology, of course, you basically learn so much about how the human body uh, functions on so many different levels. I mean, you know, the, 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 the whole body level when you use astronauts like me as subjects, but then you can work your way down to, um, you know, single systems and all the way down to um, single tissues and cells. How do cells react to microgravity? How does uh, the, uh, you know, all the, the, the genomics effect, gene expression. I mean, we're really tackling these issues at all kinds of different levels, and we are learning so much about our human body functions. Um, and then there's the physical sciences. I mean, there's so many phenomena where it's hard, uh, they're hard to study on the ground because gravity masks some effects or makes it really difficult to observe some phenomena because they're masked by gravity because gravity is a very strong force. And so uh, by eliminating those effects, all of a sudden other phenomena become observable and you're able to measure and quantify and learn and write equations. And it seems very abstract, but in the end, down the line, it might mean that you have developed a uh, lighter material for your car engine, which means that your car is lighter, which means that when you go to fill it up, you're going to just pay a smaller bill. So we are learning things that have an impact to those of us on the ground, I guess. Yes, yes, I think so. And uh, um, some things are down the line because it's fundamental research. But hey, I mean, that, that's the case for any kind of fundamental research, right? You, you just have to learn things, and based on that knowledge, other people uh, sometimes in the very short term future, sometimes it takes a while that we'll invent new technologies to make our life better based on that knowledge that we have gained. But, you know, some of the research we do on the space station nowadays has actually pretty immediate applications and that's why, for example, there's only not only like public research institutes that now research on the space station, but we also have some um, commercial um, uh, research projects. As you mentioned, one of the big areas of research is finding out how that environment affects the human body and to try to figure out ways to counter the negative effects of it. 
Well, in March, the station program is going to be sending two crew members up there for a full year to try to learn more about it. You're going to be on board, uh, one of the people on board, to greet them when they arrive. Uh, tell me your thoughts about the, the year-long mission. Um, it's exciting, I think, from a research point of view. Um, I think the research community is extremely um, happy to get this opportunity to actually observe these changes due to microgravity in the human body for a longer, for a longer term. And uh, we might do this again, but uh, the first ones are indeed uh, Scott and Misha, who will join us on the space station in, uh, this upcoming March. Um, and uh, of course, you also have the perspective as a crew, right? So you know that you have those two uh, crewmates, those, those fellow crewmates who are um, coming up and they're going to be on board for one year. And as exciting as this is, we also, I think, all recognize that it's not easy to be uh, gone for, for, for an entire year. So I think as, as crew and, um, you know, crewmates, I think we, we recognize the importance of uh, getting them started on, on the right footing and supporting them as much as possible while we are on board with them. If it comes up later again, would you like to make a year-long trip yourself? Yeah, I mean, um, I think I would, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to say for sure. I haven't been up there at all, even for six months, but it does seem pretty exciting and attractive as a perspective. Give me a couple of examples, two or three of the experiments in this area that you're going to be working on as we try to learn more about how the weightless environment impacts human beings. Yeah, and those are actually the experiments as astronauts we know the most about because we are the subjects and so we are trained a lot to perform those experiments. Um, a few that come to mind, um, there is one, it's called the uh, drain brain, which sounds a little bit scary, but <laughs> uh, nobody's going to drain our brain. The point is to um, gather data on the venous flow out of your brain. We, we, we're used to think about, you know, blood supply to your vein, to your brain, but it's actually equally important that blood then, the venous flow, the venous blood then flows back uh, to your heart. And it's a, it's a pilot project, let's say, there might be then more subjects in the future. Uh, but for now, the idea is to gather initial data about how microgravity affects that, and also to develop a very simple non-invasive operator-independent system for measuring this venous blood flow. Um, and this affects, of course, a lot and has immediate applications in the ground for people who unfortunately have insufficiency in their, in their blood return. And it would be very important to validate a technology that makes it easier to monitor their, their condition. Uh, another one is about sleep. We've known for a while that um, astronauts um, sleep on the space station is not optimal. Uh, most people tend to sleep not as well as they do on the ground. Um, there's a continuous micro awakenings throughout the night, much like people who have sleep issues on the ground. And there is a theory that it might be related to um, modifications in the mechanics of the heart. The heart is a pump, right? It has valves and it pumps all the time. And microgravity might have an effect of this, on, on this uh, very fine mechanics of, of, the, of the heart. And this might be what's causing, in this hypothesis, hypothesis, this micro awakenings that disturb uh, the sleep of astronauts. So I'm going to be wearing uh, for several nights in a row, several times throughout the mission, a special shirt that has a series of sensors on it and, um, and also has like a three axis accelerometer that be in contact with my sternum and, and will um, observe the mechanics of my heart beating while I sleep. Um, another one, a um, very interesting one that we're going to start uh, during uh, our mission is going to be me and Terry, um, the first two subjects, and then hopefully it will continue in the future. It's called airway monitoring, um, a rather complex experimental setup, so quite challenging. Um, the first experiment that will take place in the airlock because we will have to do part of the protocol at a reduced pressure. So it's going to be me and Terry in the airlock and we will reduce the pressure to about 10 psi and do a series of measurements. And uh, the point there is to um, measure the mechanics of the gas exchange in your lungs. Um, and it has, uh, of course, implications in fundamental science. Uh, we want to better understand how this gas exchange functions um, and then also validate, again, some um, measurement technologies that can help people uh, on the ground that have issues with, uh, you know, uh, breathing diseases like asthma, which is unfortunately extremely 
um, widespread on, on the planet. Those all very interesting sounding things. It'd be interesting to, to we get to see any of that. Uh, as you say, the crew members are also working on other experiments in other different areas of science beyond human life sciences. Can you tell me about two or three of those experiments that you're looking forward to uh, taking part in? Yeah, absolutely. And um, there's two areas. Um, one area is that of the life sciences that do not observe the, the human body as a whole, but rather use, uh, for example, cell cultures. Um, there is w one that is called NATO that uh, will bring to station um, uh, cultures of like bone cells. And the idea is to test the effectiveness of some specific nanoparticles in preventing bone reabsorption. Uh, we, we are used to think maybe, uh, unless we know something about it, that the bone is something, uh, you know, it's stiff, it's rigid, and we are maybe not used to think that it's actually a living tissue, but there is a lot going on there. So the uh, bone is constantly reabsorbed and then reformed in the body. And uh, we rely on this balance between destruction of bone mass and production of new bone mass. And in space, and unfortunately on the ground uh, with people with osteoporosis, this balance is disrupted. Um, and so we are trying, of course, we have a lot of countermeasures based on exercise, uh, but it's very interesting to try and look for um, pharmacological countermeasures. And uh, so this uh, experiment will look into the effectiveness of these particular nanoparticles in actually uh, diminishing the reabsorption of, of the bone. And so uh, tipping that balance between absorption and production in our, in our favor, in our balance. Um, the other thing is uh, um, physical sciences. Um, a lot of the physical science experiments on board, uh, you have to be fair, they run very much automatically. They do not require a lot of crew interaction. So a lot of time in our training, we will be trained on a facility, uh, let's say the material science laboratory, and then uh, the, um, we will be taught, for example, how to change a cartridge. We do not have, as astronauts all the time, a lot of insight in the details of an experiment but we have to be the, the hands. We're like lab technicians. We're not scientists necessarily on board. We're like lab technicians. We have to lend our hands to the, to the scientists to physically do a few tasks that, of course, cannot be done from the ground, like, for example, changing a, a cartridge. But once you've done that and you've made sure that everything runs properly, then they can run the experiment from the ground. Um, sometimes there's a little bit more involvement. Like, for example, there is this experiment called BCAT. Um, uh, which has been running for several years, but with uh, uh, different samples um, every time. And there's a lot of interest in the, um, in, from the industry in, um, in this field, the field of colloidal um, physics. And uh, there's a little bit more of astronaut involvement in that, in, the, in those types of experiment, because you actually have to go in and shake the sample with a magnet, and then you have to set up a camera in a very specific way uh, so that it can take uh, pictures um, at a certain interval, and then the scientists will actually observe those pictures to understand the details in microgravity of colloidal physics. It, we hear sometimes, we hear station crew members talking with the investigators on the ground in, in circumstances I think that are somewhat like what you've described there. Uh, it, it, must be, it must be pretty interesting, pretty, pretty neat to, to get to work with these brilliant people on this science. Uh, it, it's one of the privileges of being an astronaut is that you you really work with uh, I'd say hundreds maybe it's more of uh, people who are really top experts in their fields I mean it's 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 a unique position in which we are in um, sometimes we are actually so busy absorbing information that we do not take full advantage of it. Like, you know, sometimes I find myself thinking, you know, I just spent uh, 30 minutes talking to that person, but if I had a chance to, if I had had a chance to meet this person like years ago when I had uh, plenty of time and not so many opportunities, maybe I would have tried to talk to him or her for hours asking questions. And, you know, in our life, the way it's set up right now, you, you talk to him or her and then you, you move on to the next person. So, in a way, it's unfortunate because you don't take full advantage of this um, opportunities of interactions you have. But um, on the other hand, as you say, it's, uh, it's an incredible opportunity. Besides the work that you do with science experiments, 
the crew members on board are responsible for making sure that the station keeps operating. Uh, tell me about some of the other kinds of work that you do on board during a, a, a typical day or week. Yeah, I mean, the, the station um, has to be kept uh, in a good functioning state. And so uh, there is normal maintenance that you have to do. Um, it's just like uh, your car, right? Like periodically, every so many months, you will bring it in and uh, the, the technicians will uh, take care of replacing certain parts that need to be replaced after um, a certain time. And the space station is the same. There's uh, specialists on the ground that keep track of uh, uh, how often you have to do a specific maintenance on a piece of equipment. Uh, and the station being so big and so complex, of course, there is a lot of that going on. And now, unfortunately, of course, sometimes there's also uh, situations in which things break. Uh, and then again, as crew members, we work closely with uh, the ground. Uh, we describe as much as we can the, the situation, you know, what broke, how does it look, is there any weird smells, uh, uh, do I have a suggestions on how we could fix it. We take a lot of pictures, uh, the, the, the ground teams love pictures, um, and then all together we, we come up with a solution and uh, we try to fix it. And sometimes, occasionally, something will break outside and then we actually even have to suit up and, uh, and go outside on a spacewalk to go and fix something. Now that, of course, becomes uh, quite a bit more complex, but as recent history shows, um, the, the program is actually capable to turn around very quickly and react to a failure outside. Those are what are called contingency spacewalks. Something is broken, we've got to go outside. There's a plan for spacewalks during your time on orbit, and, and although that may change, uh, as these things tend to do, what is the plan for spacewalks during your six months? So who's going to go outside? What are they going to be working on? Um, the plan is really in flux uh, for, uh, for our expedition, so it's really hard to say. If you had asked me a month ago, I would have told you uh, Terry and Butch will go outside on two spacewalks, and I will be the um, IV, so the intravehicular um, support person who will help them uh, run all the airlock ops and uh, suit up. Um, and uh, the plan is for them to deploy a few very long cables that will uh, support the station reconfiguration that is upcoming in, in 2015. Um, the, the plan, however, is uh, very much changing uh, every day, and so we are all perfectly trained to, to go out on a spacewalk, and uh, I think we are ready to, to perform uh, anything that um, the space station program will require from us. That would be exciting if you get to go outside. I think so, yeah. It would be, it would be very exciting to go outside. Uh, the training already has been uh, very challenging, and I think mainly because it was so challenging, it was also very rewarding and uh, interesting. Um, and, and, of course, to be able to actually uh, use that training and go outside would be extremely exciting. You're going to be on orbit for the 50th anniversary of the first spacewalk by Alexei Leonov. Uh, tell me what you think about how important spacewalking has been to our efforts to explore space. Well, I mean, there wouldn't be a space station if we hadn't had spacewalking capability. I forgot how many hundreds uh, of um, um, EVA, um, extravehicular activity hours, uh, have been put in to actually put the space station together. And uh, extremely complex, I think, spacewalks, especially, you know, during the assembly phase where mainly shuttle crews would perform spacewalks. They had uh, a lot of uh, pool time underwater specifically for that one spacewalk, so um, they were extremely efficient and capable of uh, performing very complex, I like to call them choreographies. Um, nowadays, of course, we've shifted the attention more towards kills because um, the, the plans change quite quickly. It's quite unpredictable what a station crew will actually uh, do. Sometimes the plans change after the crew has uh, completed their training time in, here in Houston. Sometimes they change on, while they're on orbit. Sometimes there's a need for a contingency. So we've shifted the focus from training very hard and thorough for one specific uh, EVA content 
towards being extremely flexible and have basic skills that allow us to then perform any kind of EVA that might be required. Of course, we're not going to be as efficient as shuttle crews used to be when they were very specifically trained for an EVA, but that allows us to, to face uh, any possible task. These days, the space station is getting supplies from a small fleet of uncrewed cargo vehicles. Uh, tell me about the different international vehicles that uh, you expect to see during your time up there. Oh, we'll see a, we'll see a lot. Uh, I think the only one that we will not see is the Japanese HTV. But other than that, um, when we get on board, there will be an ATV docked, which is ATV-5 uh, Georges Lemaitre, which is already on board and docked. And uh, ATV tends to stay quite long um, on the International Space Station because it also serves uh, for reboost purposes. So the longer we keep it on board, the more we can save the um, other um, resources for reboost. Um, so it will be on board and I will have the privilege of uh, supporting the undocking and departure ops for uh, what will actually be the, the last ATV. So we're actually wrapping up the, uh, the ATV program. Um, and it will be interesting because um, the re-entry of ATV this time will be very special. We are actually working towards gathering information for something which is still far ahead in the future, but it's, it's going to be very challenging, which is what do we do with the space station once we are finished operating it? It, it has to re-enter and it has to re-enter safely. And it's obviously the biggest object ever to to re-enter um, the atmosphere and, and, and come back to Earth. So um, there is a need, the, the, you know, the teams have uh, recognized that there is a need to understand better the property of the atmosphere in certain layers to be able to better predict how the station will react, how it will slow down, how it will break up because, of course, we want it to end up, you know, any pieces that do not fully burn up, we want them to, to, to end up in the specific area in the Pacific, which is identified for re-entry, it's like that. And, and, and not, of course, to, to end up in random places. So to make absolutely and fully sure that we understand this fully, we are going to guide ATV through a shallow re-entry that should mimic what the re-entry of the um, space station will be at some point in the future. And we will have like, I think, I think 100 or more cameras set up to record this, partly from the space station and partly from uh, ground station and um, uh, ship-based um, stations in, uh, on the oceans and uh, there will be some experiments inside ATV that in part I will set up to um, observe the breakup. I think there's even a camera in there that will actually record from inside the breaking up of ATV, so we'll have images of that, and those will then be um, recovered, will hop hopefully survive the re-entry and, and, be, and be recovered. Um, so that, that will be definitely a, a very interesting time. Has the, you mentioned this is the, the final ATV that is in the plan. Has, the, has this program met the goals that ESA set out for it? Oh, I think so, yeah, definitely. Well, um, first of all, uh, all the ATVs, all five of them, have been um, extremely successful, actually, you know, in terms of performance in their missions, um, uh, exceeding all expectations. The, you know, one of the peculiarities of ATV is its ability to dock uh, in a fully automatic way. Um, that's not the case for the other vehicles, you know, Dragon or Cygnus, they, they come close to the space station, they put themselves in some, you know, sort of formation flight about 10 meters from the station, and then the astronauts, the crew members, have to go and grab them with the robotic arm, and then we will berth them to the space station. And same thing when they depart, we actually have to unberth them with the arm, and then they will give a burn and and leave. Um, ATV does all that automatically. We'll still uh, observe it from inside. We are trained as crew members to um, ob uh, monitor the rendezvous and intervene if something goes wrong, but there was never a need to, to intervene. In fact, uh, all ATVs have come in extremely, extremely uh, precisely, you know, with a precision within the order of magnitudes of centimeters. And so that's a very I interesting technology and very um, um, important, I guess, instrumental for future um, exploration. You know, if we have to build something in the future in orbit that has to 
build itself automatically and then maybe be ready for a crew to come in. Um, this, this ability to, to, to dock uh, with extremely high precision is, is, is very important and ATV has definitely proven that's possible. Um, and, and then of course, you know, uh, we have supplied, I mean, ATVs have supplied uh, about seven tons of cargo to the space station on each flight. So definitely a success. What are you most looking forward to about this experience? Um, I think, you know, I could pick many things, but I think it would be diminutive. I think what I'm really looking forward is to the experience as a whole, to turn myself into a space human, you know? We, you know, we are all born on this planet, you know, we, we, we grow up our parents and adults in our lives that help us into becoming adult human beings and we, you know we're all adapted to be earthbound human beings and you know by the time you are my age you know mature adult we are all very adapted to this there's very few surprises um, and, and then you find yourself in this completely different environment uh, where you float around all day and it, this seems you know, it has this fun component, you know, you're floating around all day, but it also means that you have to relearn a lot of basic skills, you know, from, you know, the, the really basic skill that a child has to learn how to use the, the restroom, the toilet. <laughs> you have to relearn that, and I'm pretty sure it's going to be challenging in the first days. How to set up your work environment, how to organize your life, and it's not only the microgravity, it's the space station environment, right? It's quite complex, and um, I, I think at the beginning there is a pretty big learning curve where you kind of put together all this stuff, all the things that uh, people have tried to teach you over the years, but also the stuff that you're learning uh, day by day from your more experienced crewmates or, or just by making mistakes, I guess. Um, and then I think you progressively turn yourself into this, uh, this human being that is adapted to, to, uh, to living in space and living on the International Space Station. And, and people say that it takes about a couple of months until they sort of reach that, you know, that the curve sort of flattens out. And I'm, I'm just looking forward to experiencing that and observing myself as I grow into a space human. <laughs> as you think about what you're going to do, what would you say it is that we are learning from these missions to the International Space Station that is helping prepare us for future exploration? I think quite a lot, actually. Um, sometimes people look at, uh, especially if they're not too familiar, right, with the, the space program, they will look at it and say, oh, you know, we, we went to the moon in the 60s, and, and, you know, what have we done since then? You know, we, we never went as far again. And, uh, and I'm like, actually challenge that, that point of view because yes, it's true that it was this, this great human adventure, you know, Apollo and, and going to the moon in the 60s and early 70s. However, you know, those crews went, stayed for a very short time and came back. Um, and, and all of the time, not quite being sure whether it would work out or not, <laughs> uh, with a pretty big risk factor, right? Um, what we're doing now, what we've done in the past 15 years, is robust operations. So we have learned how to conduct operations in low Earth orbit in a continuous manner for 15 years um, with an increasing level of complexity. I mean, people really should not underestimate the complexity of the space station, space station environment. I mean, the, the, the technical complexity of this uh, huge outpost of humanity in space. I mean, it's just amazing. I mean, it's worth a science fiction book, really. I mean, there's, um, and, and, and the fact that we can run robust operations for so long and involving so many, you know, international agencies and, and countries, um, if we want to conduct further exploration in a robust manner, those are all lessons that we needed to learn. And, uh, I, I think it will be invaluable for anything we want to do in the future in terms of exploration.